So, good morning, everyone. We're going to discuss peripheral neuropathies today. So, we'll go through a little bit of uh, the basics, and then we'll do a case based some cases, and we'll go through different cases. It's a really wide topic, so we may not be able to cover every single thing in peripheral neuropathy. We'll just do the main, the common things, and some of the things that are important to know. So in terms of anatomy, um, we obviously have the three modalities, the motor, sensory, and autonomic. And each, um, when you have nerve fibers, they can be myelinated or unmyelinated. So the motor system, mostly you have myelinated fibers, and you have usually large fibers. So the A-alpha and the A-alpha-beta. Um, and then we have sensory, where you have myelinated, thinly myelinated and unmyelinated. And as you see the spectrum, it, there are some which are large fibers, specifically like the proprioception and vibration sense, and then you have the, it becomes smaller, the unmyelinated small ones are for now temperature and pain. And then the autonomic can be thinly myelinated or unmyelinated, uh, and obviously those are the functions that um, they go by. So um, if you look at this diagram, we have the, uh, basically the spinal cord and some of the, um, we have the, we have different terminologies that we use. So something like um, like neuro neuronopathy. So neuro neuropathy is basically a nerve. Neuronopathy is now where you have a problem with the cell bodies, and then you have a radiculopathy, which is the nerve roots, and then you have a polyradiculopathy, which is a bunch of nerve roots, and then you have a polyneuropathy, which is nerves, many nerves. Yeah. So just term for terminology sake. So we have the classification in terms of how do we classify the, the neuropathies? And they're classified according to different um, uh, ways. So we have, in terms of pattern of involvement, you have things like, uh, so there, there where you have a mononeuropathy or a multiple mononeuropathy, where you, which is also called the mononeuritis multiplex. And you can have a polyneuropathy, and you can have a plexopathy or a radiculopathy or a polyradiculopathy. And then in terms of time course, so if it's less than four weeks, it's usually acute. Four to eight weeks is subacute, and chronic is more than eight weeks. Um, and the other thing is, according to the deficit, whether it's sensory, motor, both, or autonomic. Um, and then the other thing is the underlying pathology. So whether it's an axonal or a demyelinating, and now we have this new terminology where it's called a nodal, which is the, the node of Ranvier or you can have a mixed, and then you can have a type of fiber involvement. So we've just talked about the large and the small fibers. Uh, and then we have acquired causes as well as others. Um, so I think when you approach uh, neuropathy, and I think as we go through the cases, this is the approach that we're going to use. Um, we have six questions that we usually uh, try and address. Uh, and these questions are like, what system is involved? Is it motor? Is it sensory? Is it autonomic? Or is it a combination? And different... Um, modalities will now have different uh, differentials. So if you have, for example, motor, then you think pure motor, then you think of things like motor neuron disease. You think of uh, some her hereditary causes. You think of something like multifocal motor neuropathy. Uh, those are the common things. Uh, and for example, if you have purely like autonomic, you think of things like diabetes, things like amyloid. And then what is the distribution of weakness? So is it distal uh, versus proximal and distal? Is it a focal? Uh, or is it, uh, uh, is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? So if you have things like, if it's asymmetrical, then you start thinking of a radiculopathy or a plexopathy. Um, and so, so, so this basically helps guide us in terms of what the cause might be. And then the other thing is, what is the nature of sensory involvement? This is important because uh, it tells, if, you, if you have pain or burning, then what, what do you think of? You think of more of small fiber, neuropathies, whereas if you have proprioceptive loss, then you think of large fibers. Um, then is there any evidence of upper motor neuron involvement? In which case, then you think of other things. You think of things like motor neuron disease, then things like B12 deficiency and other things that have upper motor neuron involvement. Uh, and number five is what is the temporal evolution? And that's where your time course comes. Is it acute, subacute, and chronic? And again, the etiologies are different in, in those aspects as well. And then the last question is, is there any evidence of hereditary neuropathy? So is there a family history? Are there any skeletal deformities uh, and lack of sensory symptoms despite sensory signs? So these all point towards different things. So as we go along, 
when we go through the cases, we'll go through each of these questions um, that will guide us in making a, a diagnosis. I mean, there's a post the okay. I think the seventh one was like any medical uh, condition that may be contributed to it. Right. Okay. Okay. So in terms of the epidemiology, this is an estimated prevalence. The most common is uh, in is diabetes, as you can see, thirty two percent. But then we have uh, twenty six percent is uh, where you have like a cryptogenic, which means that a cause is not known. Um, and so that's why it's, it falls as a majority. Uh, and then we also have other things like toxic uh, polyneuropathies that accounts for about 14%, and then the others like immune-mediated, hereditary, systemic diseases, metabolic diseases, and so on and so forth. I just go back to that one slide. So the, I think the important thing about the slide is that, um, yes, diabetes causes neuropathy, and that the majority of cases, we don't find the cause of people's chronic neuropathy. Investigate them as much as you want to in them. But the issue is then about the remainder, those two larger uh, bits, the new mediated uh, neuropathies and the sort of toxic and metabolic neuropathies. That's the place that you can actually do something about. And that's why for everyone who comes with a neuropathy, there's a standard set of things you just have to go through to make sure you can capture those people in whom there's a treatable cause. Yes. Yeah, before you just say this is just your diabetes or this mm -hmm. is your So um, in terms of evaluation, you will evaluate them in terms of your history and your physical exam, and that's the main, main thing. But you will not do the extensive diagnostic testing, which includes like the electrodiagnostic uh, studies, unless uh, they have uh, other features. So if they have mild symptoms or you have an obvious underlying reason like diabetes or alcohol, uh, abuse or chemotherapy, you will not go through the whole gamut of you know trying to investigate them. But features that usually warrant a full evaluation include like asymmetry, if you have non-length dependence, uh, or if you have motor predominance, or uh, or if you have acute onset, as well as autonomic involvement, pure, prominent autonomic involvement. Also, if they have severe or rapidly progressive symptoms or sensory ataxia, you will need to fully evaluate them. So in terms of your electrodiagnostic uh, studies, you have um, your nerve conduction studies and your EMG, which are only needed, again, when you have no clear etiology or your symptoms are severely or rapidly progressive and when you have atypical features. So what do, what do these things tell us? So the, the nerve conduction and EMG will tell us if the disorder is due to either like a primary nerve problem or a muscle problem, so a neuropathy versus a myopathy. It will differentiate the two. And also, it will tell us if the symptoms are secondary to polyneuropathy or any other peripheral nerve disorder, so whether it's a radiculopathy from like a lumbar stenosis. Also, it will tell us if the neuropathy is um, axonal or de demyelinating, which will help in, in terms of management of, of these conditions. But before you go to the electrodiagnostic study, then a word of caution. Remember your history and examination. Yeah. This cannot take over your history and examination, like for instance, from history and examination, how do you differentiate between neuropathic and myogenic disorders? Sorry. We've been going through these things that you know this week. What are some of the things you think about? Yeah. 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 Although sometimes when you muscle disease, you still have the neuropathic symptoms, mm -hmm. which now could be complicating, but now small so things there. Like you're already thinking diabetes, you're most likely going to have a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. Does the patient have any other features, the heliotrope sign, mm -hmm. the um, musculoskeletal issues? Is there proximal myopathy? Do they have a problem getting up from a sitting position? Do they have any evidence of ptosis or any weakness, easy fatigability? So before you get to electrodiagnostic studies, you yeah. must already have a clear mm -hmm. thought process. Otherwise, electrodiagnostic studies are very confusing. They can actually not even give you a diagnosis. They'll actually make you more confused. Right. So these are just supposed to support what you already think the patient could be having. So a uh, length dependent is usually distal. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you have axonal degeneration as you go downwards. Mm -hmm. And also you can have, uh, like, uh, what was the, there was a word they were using. Um, like, uh, yeah, 
your, your longest ac ac accents, you have what they call a centripetal degeneration. So towards the end of the accent is where the, the, there's degeneration. So length dependent are usually axonal, uh, whereas the non-length dependent are mostly demarinating. Am I right? Yeah. And then length dependent, the pattern is very characteristic. So they actually begin with C tops, first the lower limbs, the legs are yes. involved. Mm -hmm. So you find it comes um, distally from distal to proximal involvement from the toes, the soles all the way to the ankles. Probably mid sheet, and then now you find the hands getting involved. Mm -hmm. So you find now from the tips, all the almost like a glove and stocking, but you find first lower limbs and then upper limbs in most cases. That's mm -hmm. what you call them dependent. But if you find that it's very patchy, beginning with the upper limbs, um, all over the place, that's probably not length dependent. Mm -hmm. So there are some situations where you would need to do a nerve biopsy. So where it's a it's an absolute indication where you feel like a nerve di nerve biopsy will be diagnostic um, is like in a vasculitic neuropathy um, as well as things like amyloidosis. And then in some situations where it can help is um, where but you can make a diagnosis without with with less invasive means um, like things like leprosy, sarcoidosis, neurofibromatous neuropathy. Uh, the hereditary, etc., etc. So uh, it's not commonly done, but where you are completely lacking a diagnosis and you're you're thinking of other things like vasculitis or amyloidosis or sarcoid leprosy and all of those things, then you would consider a nerve biopsy. Okay. Thanks. Did you put up the the, top, the topographical nerve nerve? Yes. The. Oh, you did it at the beginning. Yeah, I did. It. Sorry, Mr. So you all know if it's a radiculopathy, which part of the now section will be affected. If it's a plexopathy, if it's a peripheral nerve, um, you all have that. So the difference between the dorsal ganglion of the motor nerve, motor primary motor neuron, and the second and the sensory. So location of the cell body. Mm -hmm. So for uh, sensory, the uh, the cell body is located outside. Yeah. And for the motor, it's located inside. 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 So that's significant because if you have diseases which are central. Within the cord, of course, you may find the sensory nerve, which is spare, mm -hmm. as opposed to the motor. And also, it has an implication on when you're assessing and evaluating your peripheral, your electrodiagnostic tests. Yeah? But that is a bit more technical. Mm -hmm. So, it's important to know that. So, you have the anterior home cell, which is the primary motor neuron, and then you have the dorsal root ganglion, which is outside. So, you find that now for the sensory nerve, the dorsal root ganglion is outside, mm -hmm. so it tends to be bipolar. So, the proximal portion is actually the sensory. Now, which is inside, inside, proximal towards the cord, and then you have the, the sensory neuron itself if it comes down to the neuromuscular junction. And then for the motor, it's all the way from the cord, cord coming in this mm -hmm. Okay, so who wants to take us through the first piece of brother? 44 <coughs> year old man was in good health until he developed an eye infection. Several days later, he experienced numbness in the lower extremities that quickly progressed to the upper extremities. This was followed by weakness and eventually quadriparesis. Lumbar puncture revealed an elevated protein. <coughs> now conduction study showed evidence of severe motor, greater than sensory axon loss neuropathy. So can you go through those six questions? I'll, 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 I'll help you. So um, which system is involved? Uh, motor, greater than sensory. Okay. So both actually. They're both, okay. <coughs> and the distribution? So it's mainly dis, uh, distal, right? Because it started in numbness mm -hmm. in the lower extremities mm -hmm. and then progressed to the upper extremities. So it predominantly started with distal mm -hmm. and uh, worked its way proximal. Okay. What about the nature of sensory involvement? Nature. So in terms of what sen yeah. sensory modalities are involved? Ah, uh, yes. Because um, that's important. So sensory? Uh, but that you meaning sensory motor or autonomic? Right? No. So in the sensory involvement, you want to determine whether it's now your pain, temperature, uh, proprioception, vibration, mm -hmm. because it will determine whether it's small fiber, large fiber. So, so in this case, it's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What more information do you want? That's what you ask yourself. Because first and foremost, you want to know: is it central? Is it peripheral? Mm -hmm. And then when you say whether it's central or whether it's peripheral, you want to localize. Is it cord? Is it nerve root? Is it the peripheral nerve itself? Is it neuromuscular junction? So what more information do you want from here? From this, are you able to clearly tell whether it's central or whether it's peripheral? 
you need your examination. Exactly. exactly. So you need to ask more questions. What more information do you want? Because all you can tell is that he has both sensory symptoms mm. as well as motor mm -hmm. symptoms. Mm -hmm. He has a weakness, mm -hmm. he has a numbness. Mm -hmm. But those can occur with both central pathology mm -hmm. as well as peripheral pathology. I mean, elevated protein is very non specific. Anything can give you, even a meningitis will give you an elevated protein. So, what more do you want to know? The only thing that probably mm -hmm. leads you is motor is greater than the sensory axon loss in the upper. But what more information do you want? Examination. Reflexes? Examination. Examination. Yeah, there's no examination. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, all this tells is that there's something that is acute. It comes following an infection. Mm -hmm. It affected both the motor as well as the sensory pathways, but now you need other information from them. So for instance, reflexes are very important. Yeah. As we studied yesterday, if there is brisk reflex, that tells it's more likely going to be a okay. central pathology. If we have reduced reflexes or absent, it's most likely going to be peripheral. Mm -hmm. So Soraya? Yeah, so on examination, mm -hmm. there was reduced tone and absent reflexes. Uh, and sensory, there was a reduced, um, no, I'm just coming up with my own things in my head, <laughs> but there was reduced uh, sensation both to, it was mainly to pain and, um, mainly to pain and fine touch. So what are your thoughts in terms of diagnosis? Okay, I know we're going through that, but we can. Yeah, um, it doesn't say, so we have an acute ascending uh, motor neuropathy, predominantly motor neuropathy with some sensory involvement uh, for an infection. <coughs> so I uh, think of infective causes causing this delay. This uh, losses and GBS is there, top of the list. Um, he's a 44 year old man. I, there's no drug history, there's no history about um, his endocrine. I don't know if he's diabetic or not. He's not. I don't know anything about all that. We don't know his alcohol intake. I don't know about his uh, nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, whether he's a veg or non veg. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of things that are there, but those are all my, I think I'll work up my differential based on that. But my top thing, because it's rapidly progressing, yes. mm -hmm. it's uh, motor, following infection. GBS will be my first thing to rule you know, out. Mm -hmm. And then I'll also uh, investigate the other causes. And in your production studies, show severe motor greater than sensory axon loss. Mm -hmm. So just the axon which is involved. So the marriage sheets are spare. Mm -hmm. So, if it's GBS, what, which, which type of GBS mm -hmm. would you think? I'm sorry. Yeah, <coughs> because there's it's axonal motor and it's sensory. motor and sensory. <coughs> so, um, when you look at GBS, I think we all know what GBS is. Um, important to note is it's usually preceded by uh, an infection, and the most common infection is the. Uh, Campylobacter jejuni in about 20 to 20, sorry, 25 to 50 percent of cases. Um, but you have other things like uh, viruses like CMV, EBV, uh, you have your influ influenza virus, then you have other things like mycoplasma, Haemophilus influenza. Um, so the, the various variants so you have the AIDP, the, which is the acute inflammatory demyelinating uh, polyradiculopathy. And then you have the AMAN, which is the, the acute motor axonal neuropathy. And then you have the motor and sensory, which is what our patient most likely had. And then you have variants like Miller Fisher. So the AIDP is the most common variant, um, and it's primarily a motor inflammatory demyelination. Uh, and usually the progression is about four weeks. Uh, and the AMAN is usually motor only, and they have early and severe respiratory involvement. Uh, and it's a, obviously an axonal uh, uh, degeneration and often affects children and young adults. And this is the one that's most associated with the uh, Campylobacter jejuni. In terms of the serologies, you can get anti-GM1 and anti-GD1 antibodies. And then we have the AMSAN, which is motor and sensory, uh, where you have severe respiratory as well as bulbar involvement. And this has a worse prognosis. And then you have the Miller Fisher, um, which has the uh, ophthalmoplegia, the sensory, at sensory ataxia, um, areflexia, and uh, this one is 96% positive for anti GQ1B antibodies. Uh, and then we have this other variant, which is very rare. It's called the acute pandysautonomic neuropathy, which is accompanied by an, an um, encephalopathy. So, is that the brainstem variant, the biggest of 
Uh, I don't think it's the same one. There's the, the biggest, biggest stuff usually you get um, the Miller Fisher as well as like hypersomnolence. Um, to get a lot of, so you look, to get a lot of um, personality change and psychosis and all that. So just go back to that slide again. Remember, it's not always casting stone. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because even um, the, G, uh, the AIDP, which is the most common form of the GPS, historically it's always been said to be an acute motor a reflexic paralysis so patients actually bring to begin with the weakness itself mm -hmm. so it progresses distal coming up proximal so they tell you the time like this girl Ruth she's very classical but again sensory involvement will happen quite frequently rather than the unusual case so you might find other than motor a reflexic paralysis they also have the sensory involvement and they also have the dysautonomia so many times you have to watch out for their blood pressures Although what we do not, I mean, we pray for the that is that they will not have a core involvement and they will not have a sensory level. So those are the two things. So in as much as you say it's a motor and reflective paralysis, you will tend to have sensory involvement and you will also have this autonomy. Right. Quite a number of okay. yeah. So this is just a, like a diagram that shows the, the involvement. So you have the classic GBS, which they usually call it the acute motor axonal. Uh, where you have like a tetraparesis, and uh, but usually cranial nerves are not involved. But again, as Dr. Sylvia said, it's not really cast in stone. And then you have the the paraparetic GPS, which is usually the lower limbs. And then there's the pharyngeal cervical brachial, uh, where you have involvement of the bulba, um, the neck and the upper limbs. And then there's the bifacial weakness with the paresthesias. And there's also the Miller fissure, which we talked about, the ophthalmoplegia, the the ataxia. And then the biggest stuff, which we said, was the Miller fissure and um, uh, with hypersomnolence. So there are things that that will mimic GBS. So some of the differentials that you should think about when you have uh, when you when you're suspecting GBS are things like critical illness, neuropathy, and myopathy, um, and then things like uh, neurotoxin poisoning, so tick paralysis, snake bites, uh, etc. And then also the porphyria, so acute intermittent acute intermittent porphyria and also infectious causes like polio, West Nile virus, HIV, which is common in our setting, um, myasthenia gravis, and the list goes on. So um, in terms of management, you want to investigate these patients. So things that you do is uh, you can do CSF studies where you'll find the cytoalbuminological dissociation. So you can ha that's where you have uh, high, high proteins but um, normal cell count. However, when you have, I mean, if you do a CSF and you find normal proteins, that does not exclude GBS. And at the same time, some patients will actually have a, a, an elevated white cell count in, 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 um, in their CSF. So, so it's not a, like set in stone that, you know, they have the cytoalbuminergical dissociation. And then you can also test for the antibodies, so the GQ1B. Like I said, in Miller-Fisher, it's about 90% uh, sensitive, so you can do your anti-GQ1B. Um, and then you you can do your nerve conduction studies, which will help confirm your diagnosis, and it will also classify the variants, whether it's an axonal or a demyelinating. In terms of treatment, um, the most important thing is you stabilize the patient. You do your airway breathing circulation because these patients can come in um, respiratory arrest. They can come in with also circulation issues because of the autonomic uh, involvement. Um, and then you, the mainstay of treatment is immunotherapy, or you can do plasma phrases. So you do uh, your IVIG over five days, or your plasma phrases. You do five sessions over two weeks. Is there a role of steroids? The answer is no. <laughs> um, several studies have been done which have showed that um, steroids are not beneficial in these patients. Um, but the most, one of the mainstay is supportive care in these patients. So supportive care include, you know, DVT prophylaxis. Uh, and I, as I said, you can get cardiac and hemodynamic instability in these patients, so you have to monitor their blood pressures and, um, uh, and pulse rates and everything. Uh, Respiratory-wise, you have to ventilate them if, if they're at that level. Uh, timing of tracheostomy is important. And then pain management. These patients usually get pain, like severe pain, can get severe pain. So, um, you know, that's where you start thinking of you know, how are you going to manage the pain? Simple analgesics, you can use uh, the tricyclic antidepressants, carbapentin, carbamazepine. Uh, and then they can also get bladder and bowel dysfunction. Um, so how you manage that, um, you know, your, your feeding programs and, and the rest. Uh, and yeah, I think those are just... <laughs>
So we can go on to the next case, um, Jamila. 63-year-old woman presented a question. Yes. Um, assessment of the special function. Um, what is the most reliable component of the special entity that is used, supposed to be used? Because I think that's a question that keeps coming. The component of... So um, as in how do you assess that they are going to use for the components? What is the... What should we be assessing? I'm not sure. Of course, like the capacity. So I think you say between FEV1, FEC, and the blood gases. The FEC is the one that's usually used, especially for neuromuscular disorders with respiratory compromise. And the reason being because changes in FEV1 and PO2 and PCO2 are usually delayed compared to the changes in FEC. So by the time you peak changes in FEC, yeah, your FEV1 and PO2 and PCO2 may be normal because of compensatory effect. So FEC is the first thing that you usually use. And it's a very easy thing to do, the force vital capacity. Mm -hmm. It's a very easy thing to do, but we don't have the kit to do it. That's the problem. And what's the magic numbers? Is this the force vital capacity or the vital capacity? It's the, it's the, it's the vital capacity. capacity. It's the force vital capacity. It's what they can blow out. Mm. Yeah. So the FP is 2 liters. So anything less than 2 um, is uh, that, 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 that suggests possibly uh, that they have respiratory compromise. Less than 1.5, you're already starting to talk to HDU and ICU. Less than 1, you're, you're anticipating respiratory failure. Is there, is there any utility of doing serial blood gases in patients who have already compromised FEC? So like, how, how frequently should you do it uh, in a patient who's not intubated or ventilated, but there's definitely some respiratory compromise on the FEC? I think we're on a case-by-case basis. Um, so the, the main thing about neuromuscular weakness is that, you know, so the conditions that we have, Elan Barry and others that we'll discuss, they can go down very quickly. And it's a matter of catching them really. So, for example, the mice then patient Mohammed Saeed admitted yesterday, um, breathless, but maybe if it uh, sort of doesn't some more blood gas and stuff, she may have been okay. But you know she's going to crash. So you just go straight to radio. But blood gas to confirm that you can meet that really. But yeah, so we I mean, we used to use FVC before and blood gases to help confirm what level you need. But you know, that is a different setting um, uh, where you have to make a decision whether you go to HD or ICU. <laughs> what are you looking for in the blood gas? Is it hypercolor? Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. the initial mm -hmm. We got a patient who got admitted yesterday. She actually had uh, a PCO2 of 20. Right. To show that it was hypoven hyperventilating. Hyperventilating. Yeah. 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 Where we normally look for a raised CO2 for that respiratory failure. I think when in doubt, like certainly in the master classes, anything is in the spiritual rest, you just want to wait. Because they can get them good on the Okay, anyway. That's good question, though, it's an important thing. Yeah. A bedside test you can do. 63 year old woman presented a six month history of numbness, paresthesia, <coughs> bilaterally in feet and hands within three months of sensory <coughs> symptoms, had trouble turning keys in a lock, and started to frequently trip while walking. Five months after onset, rising from the floor was difficult. History of fibromyalgia and chronic joint pain and fatigue. Examination bilateral symmetric weakness in proximal and distal lower limbs and distal upper limbs, reduced vibration sensation in feet and toes, and diffusely reduced or absent tendon, deep tendon reflexes. So if you to go through the six questions that we, seven questions. <laughs> um, so which system is predominantly involved? Um, initially sensory. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it was predominant. So it's bi but it's bilateral, yeah. Bilateral. It's both, both symptoms. Both mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah, distribution is the next it's question, which is both upper and lower limbs, but mm -hmm. initially uh, lower limbs then the upper limbs. And it's distant as well as proximal. Yeah. And then um, what's the nature of sensory involvement? 
So they've said, um, in terms of examination, it's reduced vibration sense. Uh, and uh, is there any upper motor neuron involvement? No. Um, okay, from what, what we have there, no. Okay, and what's the temporal evolution? Um, chronic. It's chronic, right? Mm -hmm. And is there any hereditary component? We can't tell, it's not in history. But any it would be, it would be important, important to ask. Important. Yes. Any systemic diseases? Yes, fibromyalgia. So and then we need to investigate for others. So what are your thoughts in terms of what you think might be going on? Um, this is a patient with a chronic inflammatory, probably inflammatory, mm -hmm. um, I'd say maybe demanding condition. So we need to, to, we need further history, first of all, to fill in the gaps like family history and then the same metabolic conditions, nutritional mm -hmm. history, mm -hmm. um, because it could be anything, it could also be vitamins, could be an endocrinopathy. And then um, and then we'd do investigations. Like? Um, at still nerve conduction studies in this case. Okay. And for us, we could have to take constitutional symptoms. Yeah. Six months, six to six months history of evolution. So weight loss, mm -hmm. fever. Go on. Nerve conduction studies and equivocal evidence of peripheral nerve demyelination in the form of motor conduction velocity slowing greater than thirty percent below lower limit of normal in greater than two nerves. CSF demonstrated cytologic dissociation. The patient was diagnosed with a CIDP and treated with IVIG. Okay. So um, we'll go through some of the chronic neuropathy. So it's basically a chronic progressive stepwise or recurrent proximal or and or, or distal weakness. That's a patient who much more is required. Like the lab test, metabolic. Diabetes, yes, you want to do lab other things. Yeah, and yes. Because the symptoms are very, they are very good. So we can include a wide range of pathology. Um, and so it's important to know the duration is at least two months, uh, and you have sensory as well as motor involvement, um, and absent or reduced deep tendon reflexes in all limbs, and sometimes with cranial nerve involvement as well. And it's usually classified into the chronic axonal neuropathy and chronic demyelinating neuropathy. Um, so if you look at both um, both of them, there's a chronic axonal, and this is where your other things come yeah. in, where you so have... So you can see actually the list is quite, quite yeah. yeah. So, so what, that, what you have represented on that um, electrodiagnostic test, as you said, by the time you get down to doing your nerve conduction studies and your EMG, you should have your history down part of the examination, and you have a wide range of differential. So you go through the whole pile of tests prior and go down. So in, when, we, when we went through the history, you can actually have all of these that would have been uh, differentials in that. It's only the nerve conduction that sort of narrowed it down to now the demyelinating um, uh, neuropathies. Um, so axonal uh, neuropathies, you have endocrine-like diabetes. Could you distinguish the axonal and demyelinating from the history or in the examination? So yeah, um, usually uh, the... the uh, Demyelinating ones, they have some. This, they can have a relapsing course, or even, um, and they have proximal and distal. Usually, axonal is mainly distal, right? And uh, and then the the cytoalbuminological dissociation is more common in the demyelinating, like especially if it's like a CIDP. Um, what about the like sensory modality then? What because not all nerves are myelinated. Yes. So usually, if it's um, I, I would think because the the myelinated ones are usually the large fibers, most of the large fibers, so you get more of a large fiber in 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 your demyelinated demyelinating. Oh, uh, this very concerning. Yeah. Okay. okay, it's still very hard to delineate down parts whether it's demyelinated or yeah. it's axonal, and a lot of the pathology that gives you both could actually be mixed. <coughs> So these are some of the causes. Um, so you axonal, you have the endocrine, diabetes, mixed edema, acromegaly. You have your metabolic like uremia, you have your toxins, alcohol, lead, mercury. 
cirrhosis, amyloidosis, and even drugs um, like isoniazid, atambitol, phenytoin, thalidomide. Then you can have perineoplastic causes, um, some of your her hereditary causes, um, as well as infectious causes like HIV. Um, and then you have your idiopathic. And then the chronic demyelinating, the most common is a CIDP, the chronic inflammatory uh, demyelinating poly polyradiculopathy. But you can also have other multifocal motor neuropathy, then there's a paraprotein associated. And then the Charcot-Marie is the type 1, uh, especially, is usually demyelinating. Can I look for instance, at least you can see things like amyloidosis, the infectious pathology, the toxin drugs, will give you a sensory pain, a painful pain of neuropathy, yeah. similar to what you probably get in the demyelinating. Mm -hmm. Demyelinating is more of the numbness, mm -hmm. not so much of a painful neuropathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, if we, we can go through CIDP, um, it's, one of, it's the commonest cause of uh, chronic demyelinating neuropathy. And it's a, pr a chronic progressive or relapsing disorder where you have symmetrical weakness and sensory changes over eight weeks, as you said. You can have atypical variants where you have purely motor or purely sensory. Uh, and then you have the multifocal forms. Uh, there's something called multifocal acquired demyelinating sensory motor neuropathy, MADSAM. And then there's another a typical variant called distal acquired demyelinating symmetric neuropathy. Uh, and as I was saying earlier, to dis clues that can distinguish the, the demyelinating from the axonal type is the fact that there's a relapsing force, as well as when you have proximal and distal weakness and your CSF uh, uh, increased protein in CSF with a normal cell count. And it's important to distinguish the demyelinating from axonal. And the reason is because in demyelinating, will, you will respond to immunotherapy, whereas your axonal, obviously, you, you will not. So in terms of diagnosis, uh, this, again, as you said, will depend on your neurophysiological tests. So slowing of nerve conduction uh, in the demyelinating range or a partial conduction block will, 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 will tell you that this is demyelinating. There are no diagnostically useful antibody assays um, in this situation. And you may do an MRI, which may reveal abnormal signal and thickening of the spinal nerve roots, uh, as well as uh, some enhancement following contrast, but this is not very specific. Usually, a nerve biopsy is not performed because you can make a diagnosis based on your clinical as well as your electrodiagnostic testing. In terms of management, um, steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, the only problem is you have to have a it's a prolonged course of treatment, and you know steroids have its, its side effects. IVIG plasma exchange are very expensive, but uh, as much as we say that, it's a prolonged course of treatment, and patients need to be ready for it. Um, so the initial treatment, you can start with steroids, prednisolone, 60 milligrams uh, daily. Um, but if your response is inadequate, you and you have adverse effects of, from the steroids, then you can try IVIG, which you do the initial loading uh, over two to five days, and then a maintenance every three weeks. Um, in pure motor, uh, it can be actually worsened by steroids, I'm not sure why, um, but in that case you use IVAG as your first line of treatment. If neither work, then you can try plasma exchange. Um, several, like there have been RCTs doing uh, in terms of uh, other, other agents like methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, cyclosporine, and those um, agents, rituximab, but they've been shown not to have any benefit in treating CIDP. How long do you use steroids? Um, I think it's, I don't know the exact duration, but it's a, it's, a, it's long term, like it's months. A minimum of three months trial, yeah. and if it responds more than six months, then you can start thinking about um, uh, steroid sparing after that. So, three to six months. Three high months. dose. High dose, yeah. yeah. So, you keep them on mm -hmm. 60 milligrams, uh, so you can 80 milligrams, and then you, uh, three months, and then you can start switching over to a disease and you can carry That's why steroid sparing. Then there's a very multifocal motor neuropathy. You know, that's okay, because it's the one that responds to IVHs. So when you directly go ahead and keep your IVHs, it's confirmed. And then you give cyclical IVHs every month or every two months. Okay. I think it's okay you have one patient. Yeah. Who have seen on the website. Yeah. yeah. And they do respond well. Okay. Other? So. 70 year old man had numbness and tingling in his feet, slowly progressive during the past two years. Described as a burning pain affecting both feet that felt like a big stingling constantly and an unpleasant sensation when bed sheets touched his skin. Mm -hmm. 
he had noticed that his feet stayed blue and cold all the time. Medication or mesartan hydroclothazide, atovastatin, aspirin, duloxetin, and gabapentin. Uh, he denied any history of tobacco or uh, alcohol abuse. Examination strength was full throat, including toe flexors and extensors, and deep tendon reflexes were normal. Sensation was uh, decreased to pinprick in the lower extremities to mid calves bilaterally and decreased vibration and proprietary perception at big toes bilaterally. Nerve conduction studies demonstrated a mild severity length dependent axonal sensory motor polyneuropathy. Lab uh, studies were significant for an FPS of 5.2, a 2 hour glucose of 12.6, and HbA1c of 6.2. So if you go through the seven questions, mm -hmm. so the fibers involved, so it's mostly it's uh, sensory fibers and uh, the sensation and pain, mm -hmm. the small fibers and uh, also the proprioception. So it's both small and large fibers? Yeah, small and large. Okay. So distribution is mostly distal, mm -hmm. so it's in a small distribution. Uh, the nature of the sensory involvement, we've talked about it. There is no evidence of upper motor involvement and temporal involvement. It's chronic. Uh, evidence of hereditary and likely 70 year old. Associated medical conditions, he's got uh, impaired glucose tolerance. So it could be diabetic, uh, you know, but it's to rule out other metabolic problems okay, or infectious issues. So uh, I think th in this case, it's um, important to note so that you know even in like the early stages of, of diabetes, you can actually get uh, a neuropathy. Um, and so this, as you said, is small and large fiber, and it's, it's mostly uh, most likely a distal uh, sensory polyneuropathy, right? So if um, two-hour glucose is 12, is in that diabetes? Actually, it is diabetes. It's diabetes. Because it's a cut of is 11.1. So the, um, the important point here is that an HbA1c or a fasting glucose is not enough. Yeah, yeah. and pre-diabetic neuropathy is a real entity, and in fact, it can usually does present with mostly a uh, small fiber neuropathy, it can be painful. Um, and so all patients in whom we are thinking about diabetic neuropathy must do an oral glucose as part of the treatment. Okay. And to add on to what Sukiya said, diabetes is one of those which has very clearly outlined entities. And as you said, there's an, actually an insulin neuritis, very acute thing which comes. Oh, I'm jumping the gun. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, so it happens when either we diagnose of diabetes, especially when patients have had long standing, or when you switch therapies, maybe you're moving from the oral to the same agent you need to insulin, or when you're shifting the dosage of your insulin. So you do get an acute. So um, in terms of diabetic neuropathy, uh, we can classify it um, into like generalized symmetrical polyneuropathies. You can have the focal and asymmetrical, and you can have combinations. So the generalized symmetrical, which is what our patient had, which is distal sensory or sensory motor uh, polyneuropathies, then you can have your small fiber neuropathy, your large fiber neuropathy, and then you have your autonomic neuropathy. And then you can have focal and asymmetrical neuropathy. So that's where you have your uh, cranial nerves involvement. So cranial neuropathy, either single or multiple nerves. You have your truncal neuropathy where you have nerves in the, uh, in, uh, in the thorax involved. You have your limb mononeuropathy, so a single nerve in your um, any of your limbs. And then you have your pro proximal motor neuropathy where you have lumbosacral radiculoplexopathy, which is also called the amyotropy. Uh, and then you have a combination, so you have a polyradiculoneuropathy, and then there's an entity called di diabetic neuropathic cachexia. Yeah. Um, if you look at this diagram, it kind of um, shows the same thing that I just talked about, the large fiber, the small fiber, and then the proximal motor, acute motor neuropathies that's involving one of the nerves, um, as well as entrapment that can happen in diabetes. So, yeah, I think it's a very nice important point that diabetes is very common in neuropathy. All these other things also exist. Um, and I think it was it, it's more complex uh, than just talking about your in general, but it is important to know about them. And if you want to know more about these cases, uh, you can look up my video on YouTube. Um,
the KBSG Indian Diabetes Study Group from 2017 and talk about diabetic neuropathies. And in fact, it goes over every single type, in 10 different types. Okay. If you want to learn more. I appreciate it. Okay. So, uh, some of the treatment options uh, for painful diabetic neuropathy. Uh, you have your antidepressants, you have your tri tri tricyclic antidepressants, um, then the anticonvulsants like precabinin, capsodium uh, valproate, and then there are others uh, which are topical, mainly the capsaicin, topical cream, the lidocaine patches, uh, etc. And these are some of, some of the mimics of uh, diabetic neuropathy, uh, where you have distal axonal neuropathies like B12, you have your vasculitis, monoclonal gammopathies, etc. And then other, when you have small fiber neuropathies, which we will go through, uh, we'll go through di the differentials there. And then also demyelinating neuropathies can still be a differential. Your multifocal, like your mononeuritis multiplex, and as well as uh, other radiculopathies and flexopathies, depending on um, what the presentation is like. Celine? 16 year old girl presented with four weeks of low extremity pain in paresthesia. Seven weeks earlier, she was diagnosed with diabetes type 1. For the sake of time, we won't go through all those things, but what do you think is going on here? So yeah, she was diagnosed with she had poor poor glycemic control, mm -hmm. but now she has started on therapy and her sugars came down as you can see. Um, so as Dr. Sylvia was was saying, this is a treatment induced neuropathy. Um, it's also called insulin neuritis, and usually they get acute onset of severe distal limb pain, um, uh, and you get peripheral nerve fiber damage. And uh, they can also get autonomic dysfunction um, in these patients. Um, and it usually happens when you have rapid glycemic control. It's common in both type 1 and type 2, whether you're on oral or, um, or, or insulin um, therapy. Uh, and usually, they say that in, this, in these situations, the pain tends to be refractory. So the, the pain management is really important in this, because despite many um, analgies, analgesics, they have issues with pain. So um, we'll just go through small fiber neuropathies briefly. So they're basically characterized by structural injury affecting the small diameter um, uh, sensory or autonomic axons. Uh, and clinical presentation is dominated by pain. And as we said, the small fibers are usually the A, delta, and the C fibers that um, modulate pain and temperature. So some of the etiology, so you can, it can be purely idiopathic, where you have idiopathic small fiber neuropathy, but you also have hereditary causes uh, where you have uh, mutations in the sodium channels um, and Fabry's and Tangier's and all those other hereditary conditions. And then important things are the metabolic. So impaired glucose tolerance, this is one of the things that's, that, that's common. Uh, they get small fiber neuropathy. And then diabetes, and again, we said rapid glycemic control. Other things like B12 deficiency, hypothyroidism, CKD, some infection, infectious causes, and the rest, as you can see. So again, multifactorial. So in terms of uh, your diagnosis, so you, you have a clinical suspicion based on your history and physical exam. Uh, and usually they have sensory and autonomic uh, and uh, the signs as we saw. So you do your nerve conduction studies. In small fiber neuropathy, so nerve conduction studies would be normal. So if, you're, if, you're ner if your nerve conduction studies are abnormal, then you know this is a large fiber neuropathy. But if they're normal, then you do something called quantitative sensory testing. It's, it's some investigative tool that basically assesses the function. So it, you, you get, they give you different challenges. So, Thermal challenges, mechanical challenges, not 
pain challenges and there's a score, the way they score you um, in terms of uh, the testing. So that can be done as well as a skin biopsy. Now the skin biopsy looks at uh, your intraepidermal nerve fiber density. So these are some of the tests that will help in, in, in diagnosing the small fiber neuropathies. So if, if those are abnormal, then you investigate for the causes. And if you find no cause, then you can call it an idiopathic small fiber neuropathy. So, so yeah, I think the, the one test that's not done anywhere in years, it's called a, a, a skin and a biopsy. It's very easy to do. But it has to go to a specific lab that can know what to do with it and look at that density of the nerve fiber and try and work out what kind of small fiber neuropathy this is. So we don't have that facility. Neither do we have the facility to do proper nerve biopsies either. Uh, we can take the nerve but not to look at it properly. So it is a bit limiting what we can do. Yeah. Um, just to add that for so all, all symmetrical neuropathies, you must always do all your, your stuff, but never forget um, uh, doing a serum electrophoresis. All patients with a neuropathy must get a serum electrophoresis or immune fixation done to look for a paraprotein because that's easily treatable. Okay. All of them. Treat poly traced group also DTT. Serum electrophoresis. Try and go a bit faster now. Imran? Five minutes. Should I skip the case? <coughs> How many more slides do you have? Uh, or maybe 10 minutes. 11. Okay, let's see how we get one. 16 year old boy with no family history of neuropathy was brought to the clinic by his parents for evaluation of clumsy gait, tripping, and falling. The patient denied any problems but had a stabus and bilateral foot drop and walked with a step its gait. He had mild hand intrinsic muscle atrophy and was aryflexic. His nerve conduction studies showed a velocity of 22 meters per second along the ulna and median motor nerves without conduction block or temporal dispersion. Because of, this, because of his youth and lack of family history, his pediatrician tried IVIG for six months with the hope that this was CIDB without benefit. So, so next what do you step. think? So, what do you think so it looks like this is this could be something hereditary, which is now manifesting in this young boy. Uh, key findings here you can see are the bilateral foot drop and uh, the intrinsic muscle atrophy of in the hand, and his areflexic. So it's something definitely low motor, and uh, yeah. So uh, especially when you have not responded to IVIG, then uh, this would uh, this would predominantly be if it was demyelinating that responded to immunotherapy. I think this is something like maybe uh, just taking a wild guess maybe something just like Shakomari tooth or something. Yeah. So your next step would be what? Genetic testing. Yeah. So um, as much as there's no family history, you can get de novo mutations. So you should still do your genetic testing, especially if you have some of the classic features of Shakomari that you will go through. So, uh, so what are the inherited neuropathies? So um, you have the ones that are associated with a known metabolic defect. So you have disturbances of your lipid metabolism where you have things like Tangier's disease and then leukodystrophies and the rest. And then you have your peroxisomal disorders like uh, Fabry's, Refsum's disease. So you have hereditary hepatic porphyrias, uh, defective DNA repair, hereditary amyloid neuropathies. And then you have those are not, that are not associated with a metabolic defect. In fact, that's where your Shakomari comes in, where you have your hereditary motor and sensory neuropathies, and sensory autonomic neuropathies, and purely motor neuropathies. So in terms of your approach, you have an inherited neuropathy. What you'll do your nerve conductions, then you can have the demyelinating type and the axonal type. So if you have a demyelinating type, there are those mutations that you'll test for the PMP22 and the MPZ and, uh, yeah. And that, that's, that's when it will be your Chaco Marie to one, yeah, which is demyelinating. Um, and then if you have axonal, then you can have whether it's motor sensory, motor or sensory. So motor sensory is usually the Chaco Marie type two. And then the motor and sensory alone can be the Chaco Marie type three. Um, and if these are negative, then you do your genomic sequencing and those tests. So, yeah. so his, the, the conduction speed was less than 38. We didn't respond to IVNT, and, and it was still pointing towards the demyelinating. Yes, but what it's not an immunological mm -hmm. condition. Mm -hmm. Actually, we don't respond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also a shakomari two, um, yeah. four, 
which is also doing my knitting. Oh. So one in front of my knitting, 23 are going to be at Zoom. But I've not seen any patients here. Yes. Maybe that's when we do the genetic yeah. testing. Or two, but now we're doing testing, so mm. these are rare things. Mm. Oh, we have patients. We do have patients. We, we have a good friend of mine. But they've got all this. <laughs> so these are some of the send them to us. <laughs> some of the signs and symptoms. Um, it's usually weakness of the legs and hands, high arced feet, which is the best scavus. You have clawed hands, thin calves uh, because of muscle atrophy, um, numbness in the feet and legs, the high stepped gait um, or the foot slapping gait and then the foot drop. And usually manage it by physiotherapy. You have uh, the shoe orthotics that, that are, 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 are used. Um, braces, uh, and in some in some cases where you have deformities, you can actually have uh, surgery. So we don't see much of this, but clues that it starts early. Yeah. Patients will tell you that they're beginning to fall, they're tripping all over the place. You see the high arched feet, there's mm -hmm. family history. Yes. So ask about siblings and relatives, and the claw hand, and then the thing, the calves, the calves, and then mm -hmm. they have a very tight chili mm -hmm. yeah. So keep that in mind. So you don't say thinning of the calves? Yeah. Thinning. Uh, yeah, thinning or yes, thinning, thinning. Or, or... Okay, Said. So let's see if all right hand is presented symptoms of progressive elbow pain, medium hand numbness, and we said that we need it to keep the baseball for a few days. Play cooperative baseball most of his life and has specialized year round. So a 17-year-old man has repetitive movement of his feet in the body so many times. Now it's coming in with a with pain on the right cubital tunnel. And uh, there's an exaggeration of the symptoms when he has to prolong the infection. So I'll, I'll think of an entrustment of the elbow. Which notes? And then the muscle that has been moved. Mm -hmm. So he alluded to them as the region examining the yeah. patient. You know, we talked about them on the teaching the Tuesday. Mm -hmm. The profundas, the ones which go deep into the fingers. So you have they get part innovation from medium and also from the ulna. Mm -hmm. So the fourth and fifth is ulna. One and two and three days, and then the superficial is just come all the way to the proximal, and that one is more medium. So that one already gives you a clear indication. Let's a profound as fifth digit, it gives you a clear a key mm. So, yes, you're right, it's an honor note. Um, so, this is a uh, we'll just briefly go through this. Um, so, so, yeah, just one question. Yeah. Sorry. so, was it like an epicondylitis that eventually led to entrapment, or what, what was that? How did you get in touch? It was sports related. Again, oh, yeah. Is it? Is it the tennis? Yeah. No, the tennis is. Yeah. I think probably the epicondylitis and tennis is going to be yeah. because it's <coughs> pain. That means there's inflammation. Mm. So it's called for self. It's called It's called for self. Yeah. The same service. So, um. This is common. Um, injuries are because of sports, um, and usually uh, when they, you know, training during sport training and competition, it can happen through a variety of mechanisms. Um, so they present with pain, numbness, loss of motor function, loss of functional movement, um, and it's important to uh, define peripheral nerve injury as acute, uh, subacute, or chronic. So acute is usually where you have immediate, like a compressive stretch or laceration applied to the nerve. 
and usually happens because of um, sudden mishap like a fall or a, you know a tackle or something that that, that occurs immediately whereas subacute and chronic are usually because of overuse and that was probably the case in in our patient so um, if you, to classify peripheral nerve injury uh, there's something uh, sudden classification we have neuropraxia axonot Temesis and neurotemesis. So in a neuropraxia, where you have minor contusion of the nerve, and so that cylinder, the axis cylinder is preserved, and it's usually temporary and the recovery is, is complete. But in axonotemesis, it's where you have breakdown of the axon, but the endoneurium is endoneurium is spared. So in this case, there will be recovery, but it, it will it will take some time. The neurotemesis is where you have complete uh, anatomic section of that nerve where you actually will have no recovery. So it's important to localize the lesion. Um, so for peripheral nerve injuries, you can have a lesion all the way at the spinal nerve root level or at the most distal segment of the nerve. So you have to determine where the lesion is um, and that you can do by your clinical examination. So it's not just, in, it, it's not just enough to say that, the nerve, that it's the ulnar nerve that's involved. You have to know where the ulnar nerve is involved. And as you said, the ulnar nerve is commonly injured in baseball pitches and in the region of the cubital tunnel. I just put in a diagram to 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 just. Would you like to finish up there? Yes, yeah, it's actually the last second last slide. Okay. Great. Yeah. So um, basically, uh, some of the uh, we, I think we discussed this briefly yesterday. What are the findings you can get? So if you look, the first A is a, a radial nerve where you have problems with extensors, um, and so they get a wrist drop, and then B is where you have a claw hand, which is an ulnar nerve, um, and that's the 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 uh, medial one and a half finger sensation is lost. And then uh, C is the, now the median nerve where you have, it's called the Pope's blessing. I, I don't know why, but. And then you have the mixed ulnar and median nerve where you have um, what they call the ape um, ha monkey hand. Yeah? And then in the lower limbs, the uh, most common is the common peroneal nerve where you will get a foot drop. And then you can also get wasting on the, on the lateral aspect of the leg and weakness in dorsiflexion and eversion of the, of the limb, so they'll, they'll have a high-stepping gait. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the common. The other thing that's common, uh, so very common... Question. Yes. So how do you differentiate, um, especially with the foot drop, so many variables to look at, uh, like especially the ability to invert, invert the extensor loses longus, uh, how to... How to tell whether this is an upper motor or is it a common peroneal uh, nerve problem or is it? So I think for you, um, t I think the main thing is to differentiate between like um, uh, a radiculopathy uh, from the common peroneal nerve and uh, I think the issue is with, um, is with is inversion in a, in a radiculopathy, whereas in here, the issues with inversion. Am I right, Dr. Saki? Yeah, so that's the main thing that you test for. So the main thing to consider is the, is it perineal nerve palsy or not? And perineal nerve palsy, your inversion is intact, whereas if it's an L5 radiculopathy, your inversion and inversion are both lost. Yeah. So just the last slide on carpal tunnel, because it's something we see commonly. Um, some of the risk factors, as we know, are obesity, uh, being female, pregnancy, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Um, and in terms of uh, treatment, you have uh, you you know you can go through this algorithm where you have patients with clinical uh, symptoms of uh, carpal tunnel. Um, is the patient pregnant? Yes or no? If they yes, you do non-surgical measures. So non-surgical me measures include splinting. You can do injected uh, steroids. Um, but, and you can also have, uh, there's option to do oral steroids to relieve pain. If they um, are not pregnant, then how severe are the symptoms? If they're mild, you still do your non-surgical measures. If they're severe uh, symptoms, you can actually do electrodiagnostic uh, testing. Um, and if it's done and you have evidence of denervation, then you, you, you can think about surgical decompression in these patients.